All right. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. And I hope you all have your coffee mugs for a very entertaining conversation that we're going to have with some very, very stellar um, panelists today with me. Um, the topic today that we have is esports in India making a mark in the global landscape. And joining me in this discussion is um, Sri Abhishek Singh, who's the president and the CEO of the National E-Governance Division established by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology India. We have Roland, the Secretary General of All India Gaming Federation, Joe, the CEO of MPL Indonesia, and Anirudh, the founder and managing partner of Ikigai Law. Taking you through the session as the moderator, uh, I'm Ranjana Dikari, who's the co-head of the Media Entertainment and uh, Gaming Practice Group at a law firm in India called Nishitesai Associate. Thank you so much, uh, Pankaj and the Fiki team, for having brought us all together. A very timely, a very important conversation, I must say, um, for this forum and for our audience. So without really taking any further time, I think it's important to hear more of what our experts today have to say on panel. So I'm going to go straight to our first panelist for today, who I would also request to give a couple of lines of a brief introduction beyond what I've already introduced him as. Roland Nanders from All India Gaming Federation. So Roland, please just feel free to introduce yourself to the audience and I'll be happy to take the first question for you then. Roland, you'll have to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, thanks, Ranjana. Good evening, Mr. Singh, uh, Ankaj, uh, Joe, as well as Anirudh. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, my name is Roland Landers. I am the uh, CEO of the uh, Online Gaming Federation, which is the self regulatory uh, industry body for online skill gaming. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy to be on the panel and look forward to discussing the uh, eSports opportunity here uh, uh, yeah, along with my other colleagues. Thank you so much, Roland. We are equally glad to have you on board. Roland, you know, when I was thinking about this session and we've obviously been part of so many conversations before for this industry and various facets of it. The one thing that um, kind of always played on my mind is we keep talking about India being a great market for esports. But uh, to truly understand that, I think the audience would equally have this question as well. Why India? And does India really have a market and infrastructure to support the kind of exponential growth that you know, esports really deserve? I think you would have probably a good answer to this. So over to you. Yeah, so uh, Ranjan, I believe there is uh, the infrastructure in place. Uh, if you look at uh, any of the parameters that uh, would be taken into account, uh, for example, the, the internet users, for example, close to 700 uh, million smartphone users, you know, equal uh, number of smartphone users, close to 657 million. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, uh, the uh, engaged uh, users for esports is you know close to 30 35 million uh, gamers so if you look at those parameters we are uh, right up there with i think second only to china in terms of internet users and smartphone penetration so the fundamentals are already in place uh, apart from that there is a large uh, you know game development uh, 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 position of uh, companies that have been here. I'm told that from 25 to 250 now in the last uh, probably uh, seven to eight years. So even from the game development side, I'm aware that a lot of uh, international studios are looking at uh, India as a base for you know, developing the games. Joe would be you know better equipped to, to uh, mention some of those. But I'm aware that uh, studios like Ubisoft and some of the other large international studios are now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, having game development happening in India. Earlier, they were only, uh, you know, some outsourcing work being done, but right now they are working with collaboratively with international teams of these studios. So from the, uh, from the number of uh, uh, internet users, uh, 
smartphone users, uh, game development companies, the gaming uh, community itself, uh, you know, is extremely large. And I think those augur well for the, uh, you know, for the entire uh, exponential growth of the sports uh, sector in India. Uh, so I, I believe that uh, there is uh, definitely the infrastructure is in place. Uh, and uh, even the, even the, uh, from the publisher's point of view, I would say that, you know, most of the uh, games for the India context is adaptable to uh, mobile devices. And, you know, that has really changed the, the dynamics. So all in all, I would say that uh, the fundamental design place for, uh, for a great uh, uh, market going forward is in, it's in, it's a very nascent stage right now, but uh, in the next two, three years, uh, I believe the, uh, Indian esports uh, market will, will uh, take off in a bit more. So, and, and if I pick a few thoughts there, Roland, that you said, you know, one, you gave these fantastic numbers, almost difficult to believe if for any other country of the world, that there are these exponential numbers and exponential growth rates that we're talking about. <laughs> But I think it's just the sheer size of the market that you're looking at. You are looking at a 1.3 billion population at the end of the day. And I think that's something that everyone's cognizant of. I think the second thing that I kind of heard you say as well was there is esports and then there's gaming. Of course, there are different proponents in the industry who would like to either merge them or call them apart. But I think the common thread that kind of binds them together is, of course, this entire thing about having the IT infrastructure, which somewhere um, equally helps the growth of both these kinds of, you know, vertices in the industry. So um, I, I kind of agree with those points that you're saying. And at the end of the day, we sort of all agree that with COVID-19, just having that extra amount of time that the consumers have, the only kind of cognitive engagement that you have is through, you know, these kind of gaming or Sports or different kinds of platforms. It's just about that much of uh, you know uh, film content that one could really consume. So cognitive engagement has obviously been one of the key drivers why we've seen um, you know these kind of industries really showing a lot of promising uh, growth rate in the country. And a very good example of that would probably be um, where our second speaker today uh, comes from and represents. Joe from Mobile Premier League, uh, one of the organizations in the country today who's doing exceptionally well as a platform offering multiple esports, um, you know, uh, to its consumers as well. So, Joe, my next question is really for you. But if you could be kind enough to maybe give a couple of lines of introducing yourself, the audience knows you better. Over to you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ranjana, and thank you to Vicky for uh, having me. And uh, nice to meet you, all my other fellow panelists. Um, I, uh, you know, I joined MPL a few months after the business was launched uh, in December 2018. Which, you know, in MPL years, it's almost like dog years. It feels uh, <laughs> it feels like a very long time ago. Um, I joined as the, the CEO for the Indonesia business, and I look after what we're doing in Southeast Asia. Um, but I also lead corporate development, uh, strategic partnerships, and invest, investor relations for, for our business. Thank you, Joe. And obviously, welcome to this uh, panel with us. We're really delighted to have you on board as well. So, Joe, what, you know, I, what I was thinking when I was thinking about this session was uh, MPL is obviously a prime example of the, one of the entrants in the market. Like you said, uh, you feel like they've been dog years, but it's really been a very um, small, short amount of time that MPL has been around. But you've done wonders in this market. The, so you do have a lot of insights to offer for um, those companies out there in terms of what to look at for India. So. Um, as one of the largest esports platforms in the country, what's your experience truly really been in the Indian market? What are the kind of variants in terms of you know, the different esports products that you've seen have really worked for the Indian consumers? I'm sure that you find it to be you know, very different in different geographies in the world or even geographies within India. So it would be great to hear um, MPL's growth story and specifically some insights on what kind of games and what kind of you know esports formats are really working for you. Sure, sure. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I think we have, uh, we have grown uh, exceptionally quickly. We've been, frankly, I think, um, you know, we've obviously we've, 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 we've tapped into a, um, uh, uh, a groundswell of, of, of kind of something that's very popular, um, and, and that is essentially democratizing the esports experience. I think, um, you know, if you um, if you just take a step back and you think about what esports looked like even two or three years ago, uh, or even even to and, and frankly even to a large extent today, you know, esports it, it's a very it's a very closed activity. And what I mean is, you know, for a person to participate in esports as we know it today, you know, for example, this is a person who needs to have the ability to spend, if they want to take esports seriously, they need they need to have the ability to spend, you know, seven eight hours a day practicing um, video games. Right? Uh, they're obviously they're not not working a real job, um, or, or I mean, not not to say that esports is not a real job, but. I mean, they're not working a more regular job, if you will. Um, you know, they, they have to have a very, very strong internet connection. Um, they have to have a very high-end, uh, usually desktop device or an extremely high-end phone. But frankly, today, most of the folks who participate in what you think of as professional esports players, you know, are, are primarily desktop players. And so it's, it's actually a very, very elite sort of segment of society that has been able to participate in, in esports so far. And you know, frankly, we we believe for a company, uh, a country like like India, that that's just a, a huge missed opportunity, right? I think the 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 beauty and the and the vision, right, of of esports, and I think what's truly beautiful about esports relative to you know other sports, where um, uh, your your you know your birth rather, or or just your circumstances outside of your control can dictate whether or not you'll be successful in any given sport. I think the beauty of esports is that it can be truly democratic, right? So that a person in, you know, in, in, in a small, in, in like a, a, a small village in, in Kerala, let's say, um, has, has no disadvantage playing against, you know, somebody sitting in, 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 uh, in, in Mumbai, right? Or someone even sitting in New York for that matter, right? And that's what our platform has enabled. And that I think is why um, we've been able to grow so dramatically because we've essentially opened up esports and given it to ordinary folks on games that they ordinarily engage with. So we've, we've given it to them on casual games and given them a path to actually become full-blown esports players. So that's that's one part of the story. I think the other part of the story, and, and, it, and it must be recognized because you know, I would love to sit here and, and frankly, as MPL, we'd love to take all the credit for for our growth. But anyone who's been an entrepreneur knows that there are many factors outside of your control that, that really drive success. And I think, you know, here there are three three factors, right? I think obviously the the preponderance of, of, of better and better smartphones that are coming onto the market um, that are higher and higher spec uh, and are bringing lots of folks online. The um, you know, the availability of cheap data and effectively cheap internet to bring these folks online. And then also the, the, I think the foresight that India has had with respect to its payments infrastructure has been, a, you know, has been a real boon to the gaming industry overall, but in particular for our business as well, because not only are we bringing these masses of, you know, the 700 million users that uh, Roland mentioned online, but we're also giving them ways to transact. And, um, and and we've been a major beneficiary of that trend as well. So, so I would say it's an intersection of these two broad trends that are really driving um, driving the growth of the business. Great. I could hear so many things there that you said, Joe, about the infrastructure capability of the country, which have obviously seen a complete sea change. Just the way that India adapted to um, just the kind of, you know, online um, payment options interfaces in this COVID lockdown and the speed at which they kind of embrace as a country and as a government to implement things. I think we need to take a bow for just having been just so um, nimble about this entire journey. And I think Mr. Singh has a lot of things uh, to feel very proud about uh, from the conversation that Joe just put out so many wonderful points of the country has obviously seen um, a lot of kudos to the government over there for that. 
And I will pick Mr. Singh's brain on that in just a couple of minutes there. But I do have another question for you, Joe. Um, just talking about sure. NPL story there. So who really is your target audience? Is it the younger generation? There's a certain age group that you look at, or you know, it's just expanding depending on the games across everybody. Yeah. So um so look, I, I would say there isn't a target audience per se that we go out to market with, right? So as a business, we don't say that, you know, we only want X type of person uh, in X area um, with X habits uh, going onto our app. That, we, we never take that point of view, right? For us, we're, we're obviously open to, to, to all demos, but where we see the greatest amount of engagement tends to be among the younger audiences. Um, and it does tend to skew slightly towards uh, towards males, um, and we think that that uh, you know that that may be there for a variety of factors. I think one of the nuances of India is that the internet audience, as I understand it, in India also skews slightly male, um, and so that's also reflected uh, reflected in our uh, um, in our user statistics as well. Um, I would say you know. Uh, in terms of urban rural split, uh, there would be a, a, a slight urban bias. Um, but frankly, uh, that's also a function of you know higher quality internet penetration. Um, we're seeing, you know, I, I think one of the signs that's extremely encouraging is that we're seeing a fairly homogenous take up uh, across the country. So there isn't one particular region, uh, or there, there isn't one particular city that's uh, that's over indexed. Right uh, in terms of in terms of our user base, um, so I hope I hope that uh, that answers your your question. Absolutely, and I'm sure your investors are extremely happy. You're not bound by a certain test or a certain age group, so that's the whole country at your um, doorstep, really. So that's great to hear, Joe. But it does give me the segue to the next part of my conversation, where I'd like to bring in our third panelist for the day today, Anirudh. Um, Welcome to the session, and we'd love to hear a little bit about you before I have my first question for you. Sure, thank you, Angela. Thanks, uh, Fiki. Uh, good to meet all of you today. Um, so I'm uh, Anirudh. I'm the uh, managing partner of Ikigai Law. Uh, we are a law and policy firm with a fairly strong focus on technology businesses, um, and um, I've had uh, the good fortune of being closely involved with the digital gaming and esports industry as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, me Very short and sweet, but highly commendable. Welcome, Anurud, again. And um, I think, given the fact that you have a legal background similar to mine, I do have a question which is probably burning in the minds of many people. Anybody who wants to kind of set shop or want to invest in this industry, the first question is. Is it legal? Is it regulated? Is there a licensing regime? And, and that's the most obvious question to have for any industry. So, Anirudh, really, could you enlighten us? Um, is there um, any sort of a regulation uh, which is applicable to esports as a whole? Um, is the industry self regulating um, akin to what the gaming industry is doing? So, your thoughts on that, please. Sure. Um... So no, so there is no unique legal framework for esports as a category as a, as a whole. Um, but there are obviously aspects of, of gaming which may or, or sports uh, which may be regulated. So for example, if you are uh, if you are uh, any esports platform or any sports uh, uh, sports that has uh, say real money um, or you know, that, that, that is uh, that has a real money component to it. Or uh, you know that that is that is uh, that is going to be regulated. Or if uh, there is uh, you know the content aspect of if I were to look at the content of your uh, of your uh, esport or the uh, the IP aspects, but obviously these components are regulated by uh, by the various kind of laws and regulations that are that will come applicable. But there's no unique legal framework as such for this category as a whole. Now, uh, having said that. Uh, there are obviously certain concerns about, around, uh, you know, uh, the esport industry, which have uh, which have uh, been debated and discussed over a period of time. There are questions around, uh, say, addiction. You know, kids spending time uh, on their computer screen um, at the expense of other activities, for example. 
uh, or there is there are concerns around, uh, say, for example, aggression and violence or taunting of a certain kind. And um, and I think um, that is that is true for you know any kind of um, uh, you know uh, that, that, that is something that typically you know one thing that I'm, I'm glad is that the government has kept uh, or maintained a fairly light touch of roads to regulating this this industry and left it largely to the industry to self-regulate, which I believe is a good idea uh, for any rapidly evolving industry, right? Um, because that's that's really the only way that uh, that you know you can bridge the gap between between you know very very cliche way of saying that the regulator is always trying to play catch up, right? So you, you leave it to the industry and um, and and let them self regulate, which is largely the case um, uh, being the case in this industry. And I think the um, the uh, industry has done a pretty good job, especially in the last couple of years. We've seen uh, a certain uh, a, a growth in the industry and a certain maturity in the industry as well. Um, including from a self-regulatory standpoint. So just to give you a couple of examples of some of the concerns that I, I, I fleshed out earlier, uh, a lot of uh, e-sport platforms actually impose uh, time limits, for example, the push, send out push notifications to users if they're exceeding a certain number of hours on the platform, right? Or uh, the certain platforms which have not begun to actually maintain a ready panel of counselors, psychologists, uh, mental health professionals. A lot of them are using technology for fraud detection, for example. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of these things actually become easier uh, and uh, uh, they become doable at scale on a digital platform, unlike you know, in the in a, in conventional sport, for instance. So, uh, so I think uh, the industry has done a, uh, done a reasonably good job there. What I would certainly like to however say is that there is, where there is a possibility for regulatory intervention I think, is actually to, uh, uh, you know, to, to kind of, uh, in, in, uh, to evolve policy framework which encourages esports, uh, and I want to uh, you know talk about this also in the light of increasing recognition of esports globally um, as as a as a sport in itself, right? So um, we all know that you know, we've had uh, 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 in the in the last Asian Games, for example, we actually we had a, a medal event for esports. We've had conversations at the level of the uh, International Olympics Association. Uh, for including esports as, as regular medal events, and I think uh, uh, it is increasingly being recognized as um, uh, you know as as a as a regular sport uh, for no other reason but the skill levels that are involved for the training, the routine, the uh, the, uh, the the kind of spectator interest that these sports are now are, are now demanding, and there is a tremendous opportunity for India to actually use its policy the policy levels available to it. Uh, to encourage uh, uh, esports, starting with uh, just the mere kind of recognition of esports as a sport within our state level, uh, statewide, uh, you know, sports policies, right? Uh, so, so I would I would stop there, but I think uh, to to kind of uh, just summarize, I think not regulated as a category, you definitely have the government has taken a good stance for you know uh, maintaining a light touch kind of regulatory framework, which is largely look at the industry to self regulate. I think the industry has done a good job. And what we need is positive or formative regulation uh, to encourage these sports. Thank you, Anirudh. I think I couldn't have agreed more. Um, something that I got reminded of when you were discussing about the whole self-regulation effort. I remember about two or three years ago, um, I was speaking at a um, you know global regulators conference where they invited me as a keynote speaker to speak on the subject of India adopting a self-regulation framework. Of course, that was for the gaming industry, but each kind of learned from the other in terms of self-regulation. And it was wonderful to see that the regulated countries in the world uh, and regulators in that room were trying to learn how could they also approach from a light touch kind of approach that you mentioned, Anirudh. So kind of having a, a kind of an overarching guidance of what is right because consumer interest, fraud, management, all of those things that you really said are obviously of paramount importance, but the government, it's incorrect or rather unfair to the government as well to kind of expect them to monitor the granularities that come within, you know, how an industry functions. A beautiful example of a success story in India today is, of course, the broadcasting industry, where um, self-regulation has worked brilliantly along with existing overall guidance that they have. Um, and I think when the industry was trying to put together the self-regulatory framework, 
they did take a leaf out of how the broadcasting industry had approached it as a principle and tried to adopt it by mixing and marrying different concepts of everything from responsible gaming to all the different concepts you can think of while putting these self-regulatory frameworks in place. So I think there's something to pat ourselves on our back form. There are, of course, miles to go before we sleep, but this is probably the right juncture where I can invite uh, one of our most important speakers on the panel today, Mr. Singh. And um, I may have a few questions for you, Ms. Singh, but please, if you could uh, just say a couple of lines about yourself and your role and the initiative um, that you all have taken. So please, over to you, Mr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjan. It was indeed interesting to speak to listen to Roland, Joe, and Anirudh, their deep insights into eSports. I'm Abhishek Singh, as you mentioned. I am CEO of uh, MyGov, the Citizen Engagement Platform of Government of India, and I'm also holding charge of the National League Governance Division and Digital India Corporation, which, uh, which makes me responsible for all the Digital India initiatives that the government has taken, whether it's the DigiLocker or the Umang or the Bio Geoinformatics Platform or we recently did the Arogya Setu app in partnership with NIC. So the whole gamut of activities trying trying to ensure access to public services better for the citizens uh, in various domains. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. I I hope you heard especially what Joe had to say on behalf of the industry about the different things that the government has done as a whole and not, of course, just the IT ministry, but of course the IT ministry as well. Uh, from which their industry has really benefited. And I think one of the reasons where they saw a huge rise in the consumer base, especially during COVID-19, was not just because the consumers were so nimble to embrace technology, but because the infrastructure was available for them, uh, you know, and the government had put that together. So obviously, kudos to you and the government for that. And there are many such examples out there. But what I'd love to hear from you You've heard each of our three speakers very intently, I could say. Any thoughts around, you know, what do you think the industry means from a government's perspective? And on behalf of the government, what do you expect from the industry to take care of, um, you know, to really give them further impetus that, you know, you would probably choose to do in the coming future? So over to you, Mr. Singh. Thank you. In fact, as the the panelists have mentioned, eSports is a is a growing industry which is uh, growing very fast and globally if we see the esports market is uh, more than a billion dollars and poised to grow very fast in the days to come but if you look at india though we are one of the top leading software service providers for the world but when it comes to esports we have a very small around seven percent market share when it comes to esports uh, software that is are esports products that are developed across the world so given the background that we have in producing uh, the, uh, producing the number of tech entrepreneurs and software coders that we have, we have a huge potential to get a bigger slice of the whole cake, which will mean a lot for the economy as well as ensure that we we produce the companies which will uh, which will write codes for these new games that will come up in the esports domain, not only for the domestic market but for also for the international market. In fact, uh, very recently we have been working on in promoting the toy fair, which Honorable Prime Minister is mentioning, and with Banki Bath also you mentioned. And there also you mentioned, can we think of designing esports, which uh, which which helps in which uh, which takes uh, which kind of builds upon on the rich cultural heritage that we have in our country, as well as uh, it can be used for pedagogy. Like there are a lot of concepts that can be taught in schools by using uh, gamification, by using technology, uh, so that it's not a routine uh, lecture that a child is learning. On a on a Zoom platform or on a team video conferencing platform, but he's learning the concept by using a gamification theory. Like very often we see that when a child attempts a, uh, uh, when he plays a game, any simple game that he's playing on his video game or computer, if he fails, he tries to attempt it again. So the desire while one does is to excel in the game and try to achieve the target. But while the same thing, if he's practicing maths or something, and if he's not able to get it right, then very often he gives up. So how can we marry the two concepts and use the concept of esports for pedagogy, for learning? So that's also another aspect that we are looking at. The employment potential is definitely there. The contribution to the economy potential is only there. Is also there. The concern, some of the concerns Anirudh mentioned is like when we promote that, self-regulating is all is uh, all right. But when we promote esports, we also have to ensure that 
any e-sports product that is sold, uh, that's marketed, that's made available to the users has to conform to the basic laws which are there. There is no regulation per se for e-sports, but there are other laws which one has to comply with, whether it's, uh, whether it's promoting, whether it's a game is, whether an e-sports product is skill-based or whether it's a game of chance or whether it's moving towards the zone of gambling. How much of it is leading to addiction? What features a game has in order to restrict the usage beyond a few number of hours? We have seen a lot of companies which have come up with solutions wherein they have these uh, these features built in. It won't allow you to play for more than an hour. It won't allow you to play for more than 45 minutes. It will send alerts to the parents uh, as and when it's required. So that kind of controls has made such uh, games more popular and uh, confirming to the laws. And I would feel that till the till there is definite reason for the government to intervene, there should be no reason to over uh, regulate a sector till it gets established. Recently, the Niti Aayog had come up with the guidelines for fantasy sports. Because that's again another sector that's growing very fast. If we look at the recent IPL and other most of the sponsors were uh, Dream Eleven and other products that were uh, marketing. They also claim to be uh, skill based. Only thing that we need to ensure is that. Whichever products are available, whichever products are available in the field of esports, they confirm to the given laws. They ensure that they follow the norms that have been set up themselves by the industry, and there should be no reason for the government to intervene. Government will intervene only when there is a violation. Because then it's a responsibility of the government to ensure that there is a level playing field amongst all the service providers, and there is no attempt to directly or indirectly violate any given laws. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Singh. I think what you said. So crisply, especially the statement that you made about um, there's no need for the government to intervene if somebody is really doing something legal. So it goes hand in hand with what Anirudh said, what Joe said about having that light touch regulation and the government really having a very overarching role to play, which is very heartening to hear today that that's how the representatives of the government are also looking at it. It kind of, you know, there's a sense of satisfaction that I think the industry will feel as a whole and a lot of investor confidence as well, I'm sure, where they know that the government is on the same page as the way the industry is thinking. And I think in put it in one word, progressive is the word. That's where you're trying to move to. And and that's really great to hear. Um, I think um, all the different initiatives that you spoke about as well, I think will continue to fuel in for the growth and progress of this industry, growth and progress of, like you mentioned about the fantasy sports and other skill gaming industry operators. There were a few things that both you and Anirudh obviously picked on. I'm sure the audience wants to hear a little more about it. So I am going to take this conversation back to Roland. And um, Roland, I think one of the things that Mr. Singh very correctly kind of phrased, and I think every country, when they're looking at what does an industry have to you know, give back, um, it's something that you always look at to say that uh, what's the contribution that the industry is going to make? You know, what are you giving back to the economy? So is there a contribution that you as an industry leader anticipate that esports going to make in terms of job creation, infrastructure, economy as a whole? Any thoughts really, Roland, on this one? Yeah. Uh, I would like to... Uh comment Mr. Singh on what he said because this entire uh, gaming uh, experience uh, for India and including esports uh, is a direct beneficiary of the Digital India initiative undertaken by the Honorable Prime Minister. So, uh, you know, kudos to the government for the work they're doing there. Uh, coming to the, uh, you know, as far as esports, as we all know, the uh, you, me, Anirudh, uh, you know, Mr. Singh, that uh, the uh, the online scale gaming industry obviously you know is scheduled to uh, reach its target of a uh, billion dollars this year in 2021 uh, we are in the last one though but um, if you look at esports in comparison you know it's a very at a very nascent stage uh, however india is going to see you know this entire mobile first uh, esport experience unlike the western world where it is still to a large extent you know pc uh, console driven. So that would be uh, really a game changer as far as India is concerned. Uh, uh, the numbers are, you know, really uh, small at this point, maybe, uh, you know, 150 million, uh, not more than that. But definitely, if you look at the uh, the contributing factors, for example, 
uh, I know for a fact that you know in the education uh, uh, side, uh, there is a groups, you know, international groups like the Pearsons group, which is uh, working with the British uh, Esports uh, Association to develop uh, uh, esport education and you know train uh, future uh, uh, people you know who would come into various aspects of the gaming uh, esport business, which is you know marketing, sales, uh, game development, etc. So those things are already happening in India right now. Uh, if you look at uh, the number of professional gamers, last year there was about 25, 30,000 professional teams, esport teams. Look at individuals, uh, this year will be close to you know, 2 lakh professional players. So this entire um, uh, combination of uh, amateur uh, esport uh, gamers, which you know, uh, Joe and MPL uh, cater to a lot, and also they also you know uh, deal with the professional uh, uh, players who would you know go on to uh, go on to probably you know represent the country win medals in whichever tournament uh, it is applicable uh, there is this entire emotive side also uh, as uh, that india can benefit from which is uh, like kid netha won a bronze medal for us uh, in the last nation game you know going forward uh, other medal uh, prospects india can uh, develop in esports in whichever category there are about 40 game formats so some of them can be when they are included in a large uh, gaming tournaments uh, you know india could win some of those because we've seen our ability to excel in uh, mind sport and uh, and you know uh, where there's uh, uh, skill involved so those are the benefits i think economically right now it is at a nascent stage but definitely i see in the next two three years you know uh, it uh, going to about uh, you know, half a billion at least in the next two years, easily in sport uh, phenomena as far as revenues are concerned. If you look at uh, the jobs, uh, as I mentioned, there are about 250 uh, uh, game game development uh, companies here. There are the studios who are, you know, setting up shop. So direct and indirect jobs also, I think there's a great potential. Uh, just like we've seen with our, you know, online skill gaming sector, uh, uh, making available, you know, uh, tens of thousands of jobs. So, all in all, I feel that uh, uh, esports is going to be a big contributor for the nation building, not only uh, uh, from you know from the perspective of revenues to the exchequer, but also from the uh, from the uh, perspective of uh, uh, creating professional gamers and you know direct and indirect. Thank you, Roland. That's a question from you. It doesn't matter if you're bullish or bearish about this industry. At the end of the day, you cannot ignore because there is something great to offer uh, by this industry. I am conscious of the time on the clock, so I'm going to have two quick questions for Joe and Anirudh, and then I will bring it to Mr. Singh to give the concluding remarks for the session. So perhaps I could go to you first, Anirudh. I did hear Mr. Singh also, you know, bring out the whole point of um, aggression, and of course you know, protecting the consumers um, as such. I know this is a question that, you know, you, you brought it up earlier as well, but tell me, do you feel that esports are really associated with, you know, addiction, aggression? Is there really merit to this argument? And um, how do you see the industry resolving it? I know I heard you say a few things before, but perhaps, you know, for the benefit of everyone, you could give a few words about this. Sure. No, Ranjana, I mean, it's a very important question and so much so that there is a fair bit of uh, academic uh, research that has been done on the subject as well. There's interestingly no research which actually links uh, esports with aggression as such. Uh, on the contrary, uh, you will find studies and surveys uh, which go on to, uh, which try to make uh, the argument that uh, in fact, uh, esports are can, can even be cathartic for aggressive people or, or give a wink to uh, to people for aggression or, uh, you know, so, uh, so there are, I, I think, um, uh, th there's some interesting kind of divide on this, uh, on this, on this question. And honestly, if you ask me, the, the argument applies when you go into content on other mediums, for example, television, right? So just because you, uh, show movies with people wielding guns, um, does not mean that the audience will replicate this behavior in real life. Now, what the industry can really do and has been doing in some, uh, to some extent is to develop systems for, um, you know, content description and and uh, and making sure that you serve the right kind of content to the right age group, uh, which is exactly the model that has worked very well. And uh, you know, is something that's deployed for 
other media as well, right? So some developers follow what is called as the uh, the International Age Waking Coalition, IRC, right? Which categorizes games uh, based on um, on. So if if you're talking about a game that has some violent content, it actually segregates that content basis. Uh, uh, from from uh, uh, very little violence, which is non-realistic violence, non-graphic violence, to realistic violence, and then graphical violence, and then you serve it to different. You 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 impose certain age limits to which age group can really uh, consume what kind of content. So there are there are ways to address this, but really there is um, nothing. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's no kind of academic study that backs this. In fact, there are studies which actually uh, negate that argument. Um, uh, so that's that's my take. I think I, I think the industry. Is somewhat doing, uh, you know, is taking steps to kind of self-regulate um, in, in this uh, on this uh, aspect. Thanks, Anurad. And I think I would be in the same court as you, saying that it's not really a dict, and there are ways of sort of balancing it out. I think the concerns also stem from the fact, and you know, like Joe obviously probably has the benefit of having a much wider age group of people coming to his platform, but a lot of other esports um, operators might be having a, a lot of the younger lot, which would be primarily children as well, you know, below the age of 18 coming on their platforms. So I understand where the concerns get heightened from. Uh, and I think the other OTT platform players are facing a similar kind of an issue, right? I do see the efforts that they also make on a self-regulatory um, footing, where they're trying to sensitize, educate, um, not just lawmakers, but educators, parents, and the students themselves about the pros and cons and benefits of something. And that's a great way of also, you know, imbibing as a part of a self-regulatory framework, you know, kind of informing and educating your target audience as well, even if they are children. And um, speaking of which, I think um, the last question that I actually have for Joe, something which um, Mr. Singh also said, uh, and he spoke about, um, you know, how we need to have more and more stories from uh, Indian mythology, Indian stories. So basically, a little bit more of diversity inclusion, and something which Joe said earlier about how maybe the audience today is a little more centric towards male. Um, we did this, you know, topic a couple of days ago, I and mean, we talk about diversity inclusion and whether it's about a different culture, uh, whether it's about a different gender. I think it also boils down to obviously one, what's the kind of consumer base that you're attracting, and two, what kind of products you're putting out there. And I feel that increasingly today, different um, game developers are coming up with products, giving the Indian story. And also not, you know, um, making it centric to a certain gender, but making it agnostic. I read this report where I believe there are about 80% more women users now on all platforms, whether esports or gaming. So that is probably another opportunity, which I hope would not be a missed opportunity. And that's somewhere where I'm going to pick Joe's brains as well. You've been forward looking as MPL as a platform. Obviously, the investors have had immense um, you know, confidence and um, have decided to join hands with you. There are a number of different organizations and operators out there who are probably planning to you know, join in the same boat or they are planning to uh, tread a path which will hopefully make them India's number two MPL another day or you know, maybe be a competitor. What would be your words of wisdom to them? Any two or three things after having dealt with the investors, the government, anything that you'd like to tell the government to make this entire environment more conducive, to attract more investments, make the startup community more happy? Generally, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, you know, there are a lot of questions in there. Uh, I think, I, I think, um, you can cherry pick that. yeah. <laughs> Uh, look, I, I, I think um, as I think about esports, what's really exciting to me is that, particularly for you know, as an Indian and and you know, being sort of in a leadership role at an Indian company, I think what's really exciting for you know, for all of us is that um, there's no clear winner in esports, but. If you just think about the potential market cap of this opportunity, you know we think that this is a you know uh, uh, there, there's you know 
a, a massive, I, I don't even want to put words, uh, I don't want to even want to put a number on it because I, I think the opportunity is truly, truly massive. And I do think there's a real opportunity now for, you know, an Indian business to be the Facebook or Google of this space, right? And I, and I do think that the opportunity set is as large as the opportunity set that, that, that a company like a Facebook or a Google is going after. Because essentially, you know, our view at MPL is that the market cap of esports is probably larger than the market cap of all other sports combined, right? Because there are really no limits in terms of how many people can participate, how much content can be created, and also how often you can do these sports, right? So I think the the combination of those three things makes this a massive massive opportunity and i and i you know what what i would say is you know i'd encourage i think you know we welcome competition um we're of the view that our competitors make us better um they you know we're not trying to i mean if we're not able to outperform our competitors then shame on us um so as long as there's a level playing field we welcome you know we welcome uh, uh, other competitors so you know, I think that's that's totally fine. And in fact, having more and more players in this industry, I think, will only um, help the overall uh, sector. But I, I guess the the big message I would say is that, you know, look, this, this is this is one place where I think you can see Indian businesses really take a global leadership role. And I think that's extremely exciting and and it's pioneering um, uh, in this uh, you know in this regard. Um, with respect to your a previous question about what I would um, recommend to to you know other entrepreneurs, other founders. You know, I, I think you know a couple of uh, uh, very tactical lessons for us that that we've learned. Um, one is to never judge your customer, um, and you know to again you know to let your customer tell you and and show you through their actions uh, what, what, what kind of what, what do they what do they enjoy, what do they like to do, and and ensure that your product is actually serving them. Um, I would say the other the other nuance that's uh, often lost amongst a lot of tech companies is really the value of building a brand. Um, this is one thing that a lot of the older, um, more traditional, if if I can say that, uh, companies understood well, particularly in the the, the direct to consumer retail space um, or anything that's truly consumer facing. But uh, a lot of tech companies, I think, don't really, have, haven't really understood this lesson, that there's real value in building a brand and nurturing a brand and, and investing in a brand. Um, we, we've been, uh, you know, we've been fortunate to, to have had folks who've, who've kind of pushed that for us internally. And I think we've been, uh, we've been quite lucky uh, to have, uh, you know, a, a great branding team and some great brand ambassadors as well. Um, and and I think we're you know we're reaping uh, we're reaping the benefit of that. So I think that's also kind of one, I guess, tip you know for uh, for 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 other entrepreneurs. I don't know if that's sort of the flavor of, of perhaps what you're looking for, uh, but but happy to expound on any of those points if you if you'd like. So we I'm sure the audience would love for you to take each of the facets and talk about it to them for a longer time. Unfortunately, we've run out of time and I'd really like Mr. Singh to also come in, but I did, you know, really, I heard each of the tips uh, very closely. And I think as a market leader, like you said, right, um, MPL needs to kind of set that kind of platform and make the environment more conducive for more competition to come in because that's how your industry is going to get better. And you're right, we'd all like to see um, the next Facebook, Google of eSports to be from India, but that could happen only if you have a very supportive parent in the form of the government. And I know Mr. Singh has been listening in very intently to the second segment of all the recommendations that have come in. Uh, one of the things that Anirudh did mention before uh, as well was the need for having some sort of a regulation to give more and more impetus to this industry, but at the same time, keeping it light touch. So there are a lot of thoughts out there on what the government could also take back and look back into. But honestly, it's the time that I would bring Mr. Singh in for his final concluding thoughts and anything that he would like to communicate to um, the audience as well as, um, you know, uh, 
the industry players who are here. Uh, yeah, thank you. In fact, uh, anyone? Yeah, so interesting thoughts from everyone and uh, it does put the entire subject of esports with regard to the possibilities, the potential, the economy, contribution to the economy, job creation, or, or the opportunities for startup uh, entrepreneurs and investors. Along with that, the risks and the concerns involved in the need for regulation or uh, keeping it like uh, allowing the sector to grow. Only thing that I would like to say is that uh, the very important one point which Anirudh mentioned that uh, we should not like kind of blanket ignore the fact that it doesn't lead to violent behavior. I have seen I have seen a lot of cases in which kids have got addicted to it. It has led to led to various kinds of uh, mental uh, mental health issues and uh, trauma for the families and all. One needs to be aware that these risks are there. It's there not only for esports, but there it's there for many other things. People can get addicted to multiple things. So esports has also that risk. We should not turn blind to it and say that it doesn't cause and hence we will not uh, look at that aspect. It does. And there have been cases in schools which have been reported. There have been cases which has come to knowledge in uh, various sectors. There are ways to deal with it. There are ways to handle it. The industry, many, many games, as I mentioned, have those features. So one would need to understand that, yes, while it has a potential the sector, which is growing very fast and rapidly and has a huge potential to contribute to the global IT industry and the national IT industry. At the same time, we have to be oblivious of the fact of the risk involved, the concerns which are there, the need for adherence to the laws and ensuring that when the self-regulation mechanism is there, it's fair for everyone. It's fair for the game developers. It's fair for the investors. It's fair for the tech esports companies. And it's also fair for the for the users, like those who are playing that game. What What is the deal that they are getting and what is it that they are signing up for? Not unlike many other platforms which take people in and then it very, becomes very difficult to come out of it. It should not become like uh, very recently, in fact, to cite an example, one uh, esports company called Scarface who won the app innovation challenge in the gaming category that we had held. They claimed to be the PUBG of India and then they said that they are designing a game which is uh, which is similar which is similar to the chakra view of abhimanyu those of you who are familiar with the mahabharata would understand that he like how you can get out but he said that in my game there is a way to come out of the mahabharata of the chakra view so when we do this when we tackle issues related to esports one should realize that we should frame the regulatory framework self regulatory or otherwise in such a manner that if there is a risk there should be a way to come out of that risk so once that that is taken care of, then I think we'll be good to it and the sector will be poised to reach its potential that we have all have spoken about. So that's all that I wanted to say. And thank you for hosting this, Fiki and uh, Ranjana and all the co-panelists. Thank you so much, Mr. Singh. I do believe what Anirudh, you know, also wanted to say was on a very similar footing to what you said. Um, I think we are passionate about, you know, a, a certain schools of thought. And we all agree that there definitely are a very vulnerable section of the society, which I do believe the industry players are very conscious of, very cognizant, and it forms a very important part of the self-regulatory framework. And um, kudos to them for that. I do hope that you increasingly focus more and more on this vulnerable section of society, whether it's the children or just the people who probably do not have enough means um in life uh, to afford things but might be addicted for a lack of a better term on your platforms now having said that this has been a brilliant discussion with all my four panelists thank you Fiki. uh thank you mr singh joe anirudh and roland for having shared your thoughts today and with that i'd like to sign off and hand this baton back to pankaj from Fiki. so pankaj please over to you <laughs>